This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Defense policy expert Stephen Miles says that if the Iran nuclear deal is blocked by Congress, it will lead to war, and many Republicans want that to happen. Maybe Donald Trump's anti-Hispanic rhetoric will make no difference, because voting analyst Daniel McGraw says the Latino vote won't make a difference in any states other than Florida and possibly Colorado. And Bill Press talks with Congressman Dan Kildee about Iran, Hillary Clinton, and the TPP. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Stephen Miles, an anti-war advocate and defense policy expert, says if Congress kills the Iran nuclear deal, it will lead to war. And that's what many Republicans want. And we say hello to Stephen Miles, the advocacy director for Win Without War, a diverse coalition of 40 member organizations formed in opposition to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the underlying national security strategy that created them. Stephen Miles, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks. Glad to be here. And we're happy to have you with us. Uh, The Obama administration says it is committed to preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. If a deal falls through, would that actually be the result? Well, one thing that's clear, if this diplomatic path isn't seen through to the end, if this deal falls through, the most likely outcome is a return to the path of escalation. And we know where that path ends, and that path ends in war. You know, the reality is, is that there are folks in this country who want to see us get involved in a war with Iran. They're hoping that diplomacy fails so that they can see that outcome come to fruition. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our country to see this diplomatic path fully exhausted, make sure that we uh, try to get a diplomatic deal, because the alternative, frankly, is, is too scary to think about. What's I, I don't understand the argument for, you know, that that want to go to war with Iran. What what good does that do anybody? Well, there's folks who believe that the only thing that the Ayatollahs and the, and the leaders in Iran understand is military force um, and that they need to be dealt a blow. They, they believe um, quite foolishly that it would be a very easy military confrontation. Uh, Senator Cotton said it would be a matter of days of bombing to take out their nuclear infrastructure. Um, you know, this is this is the same kind of foolish, irresponsible um, uh, national security policy that was that led us to the Iraq War. These folks thought the Iraq War would be a cakewalk. Remember, it was supposed to be a couple billion dollars over in a matter of weeks, and instead, here we are again, all these years later, still involved militarily in Iraq. So the reality is is that their delusions about this being easy and getting a quick, decisive uh, military victory simply don't bear true. Well, now, is it possible that Iran doesn't even want a nuclear weapon, that it simply wants to be seen as the major power in the Middle East? Well, sure. Let, let's, let's start with the Iranians have always said they don't want a nuclear weapon. The Ayatollah has said uh, issued what's called a fatwa against the use of nuclear weapons and against nuclear weapons. But, but let's be clear. This deal isn't about whether the Iranians are being honest or if they're lying about wanting a nuclear weapon. This deal is about shutting down any potential pathway, whether the Iranians want to get a nuclear weapon or not. We also need to remember the reality that these are complex issues, and leaders uh, of countries frequently have different reasons and rationale for what they're doing than when we may see on the surface. You know, we, we couldn't understand for years why Saddam Hussein was presenting himself like he had a weapons of mass destruction program, when in reality it turns out he didn't. The, the, his concern was that he didn't want the Iranians to know he didn't have one. So it's very possible that the Iranians simply want the world to believe that they're right on the edge of having a nuclear weapon. They want to keep extracting concessions. But again, none of that ultimately matters at the end of the day. The only thing that's important is can we shut down their pathways to new, a nuclear weapon? And this deal is the only way to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, one side of the argument about trusting Iran is that all countries do what is in their self-interest. The other side argues that Iran's leaders are unstable rel- religious zealots. Who should we believe? Well, like like everything, the answer is somewhere in the middle. You know, look, the Iranian leadership is not singular. The Ayatollah obviously is, you know, quote unquote, the supreme leader and has significant power. But Iran is a country with many different 
um, points of political power. President Rouhani has significant political power. The Revolutionary Guard, on the other hand, and hardliners in the country have significant political power as well. So we can't act as if Iran is simply one actor. There's diverse and complicated politics at play. Um, and what we need to be doing is understanding that in that political game going on within Iran, there are hardliners who really want to do us harm, and there are pragmatists who want to ease Iran's reentry into the international community, are open to things like conversations about human rights and making reforms in Iran. We want to be empowering folks like those under President Rouhani's leadership and, dis- and discrediting and undermining the hardliners. The, in- the impact of this deal will be just that. And unfortunately, if we scuttle diplomacy, if we blow this chance, if we return to the path of escalation, we're going right back into and empowering the hardliners and empowering those people who, frankly, are not reasonable and who we can't make a deal with. We're speaking with Stephen Miles, Advocacy Director for Win Without War here on America's Democrats dot org. Uh, Stephen, outside is, is outside inspection of Iran's nuclear program a deal breaker for either side? Well, the reality is is that under the framework agreement that they've announced, there will be outside inspection. There's outside inspection right now under the joint plan of action, the interim agreement that the Iran that Iran and the U.S. and our partners signed. And we've had more access than we've ever had into Iran's nuclear program. We've learned things about it we never knew before. That's given us the trust to be able to go to this next step. And this next step will require even greater inspections, even greater access, really an unprecedented look inside Iran by the international community. That's going to be on the table. The Iranians have agreed to it. The Americans have agreed to it. The rest of our partners have agreed to it. We're negotiating some of the finer details of that, but that will be part of this deal. And that's the most important part of this deal in some ways. And what about the the lifting of, of the economic sanctions against Iran? Well, we need to understand a couple of things. Iran has a number of sanctions against them for various different behaviors, for their support of terrorism, um, their violations of international human rights. Those sanctions are going to remain in place. They're going to stay right where they are, just as we sanction other countries like Russia, countries in Africa, elsewhere for, for those types of violations. What we're talking about here is sanctions that the international community put on Iran to get them to the negotiating table to make this kind of deal. As part of the deal, those sanctions are going to be eased, and eventually, after Iranian, Iran's compliance is verified, those sanctions will likely be lifted. But again, those sanctions only existed to get Iran to this point, and they're the carrot that is part of this carrot and stick approach. Lifting mm-hmm. those sanctions, I should say, is the carrot. Yeah. And what about there's this rabid anti Americanism of Iranian leaders going back to 79, but the Iranian population generally likes the U.S. and Western ideals. I mean, maybe maybe we should be negotiating with the people and not the leaders. Sure. Well, I mean, it's worth noting the U.S. has had some fairly rabid anti-Iranian sentiment in our leadership, but the American public is actually very, very supportive. And every time you meet uh, the Iranians, whether it's the Iranian-American community here or Iranians who travel here for education, there's very good, strong people-to-people relations. We should be doing things to build upon that because the people of Iran, the people of America, we both want to see the same thing. That's peaceful resolutions to our conflicts. That's a path forward that um, ends the type of aggression and conflict that we've seen. The reality is is that the current leadership in Iran, you know, Foreign Minister Zarif, for example, he was educated here in the United States. The, the, re- the leadership is a lot more complicated and complex than we give it credit for. And there are folks who want to be pragmatists, who want to be taking steps forward and coming to a plan where we're solving our solutions through diplomacy and not through military action. We want to be empowering those leadership and we want to be strengthening and building upon those ties between Americans and Iranians who all want to see the same peaceful outcomes at the end of the day. And it, and it certainly seems, on the surface anyway, that the, the U.S. And, and, and the other nations have taken a very uh, slow-step approach to, to trying to get to some deal, which, which has to bode well for an overall deal when it's finally said and done. Yeah, I mean, look, it took us 35-plus years to get to the place where we are now. It's going to take a number of years to, to rebuild and to address all these concerns. And, we're, again, we're only talking about one concern here, Iran's nuclear program. The U.S. and Americans have a host of other concerns about the Iranian regime and the things they do and say, and we're going to continue to address those. But this slow and steady approach, this is how diplomacy works. This is how you solve problems. It's not as gratifying as dropping bombs, but it's a whole lot more effective at the end of the day. 
Okay. Stephen Miles, Advocacy Director for Win Without War, joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Stephen, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks. Happy to be back anytime. Thank you very much. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Daniel McGraw is a journalist who has been studying voting patterns, and he says the Republicans have a problem. And it isn't the Hispanic vote. It is the fact their voters are dying off faster than they're being replaced. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. If you think that none of today's presidential candidates care about people like you, check out Republican Scott Walker. The Wisconsin governor not only cares, he wants to sit down with you, get your ideas, and stay in close touch. No matter who you are, Scotty wants you to join his team so his presidency can be your presidency. Not a Republican? No problemo, amigo. Walker doesn't check your papers. Well, except for that million-dollar check you have to write to his super PAC. That's the ticket price for entering Walker's inner circle, where you can discuss your policy concerns and seek personal favors straight from your lips to the candidate's ear. Even if you're a common working stiff, just give a million dollars and you're in. Is this a great country or what? Maybe you're wondering what specifically your money buys. Well, Scott's Super PAC even prints out a handy purchasing slip showing that you'll be, quote, an executive board member of the Walkerites campaign. Thus, you'll have two private dinners with a man, a Walker staffer dedicated to your needs, special briefings and weekly emails, bi-monthly conference calls, biannual retreats, and best of all, quote, an exclusive executive board pen. Golly, I haven't been this excited or felt so included since the 1950s when I became a member of the Mickey Mouse Club and got my own set of mouse ears. This is Jim Hightower saying, when the Supreme Court descended into the Alice in Wonderland fantasy that corporations are people and money is speech, it was inevitable that American politics would devolve to a frivolous game that shuts out the workaday majority and enthrones a Koch brothers plutocracy sustained by secret money super PACs and whorish candidates like Walker. To help end this corrupt mockery of our electoral democracy, go to democracyisforpeople.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor. All for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Despite the nasty rhetoric from Donald Trump, the Hispanic vote won't make much of a difference in 2016, says voter analyst Daniel McGraw. Why? Because the Hispanic vote simply is already a lock for Democrats in all but possibly Florida and Colorado. And we say hello to Daniel J. McGraw, Cleveland area freelance journalist and author. He has served as a senior editor for U.S. News and World Report. His work has also appeared in The Village Voice, Reason Magazine, Salon, Politico, The Guardian, and many, many others. Daniel McGraw, thanks very much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm well. Thank you, sir. Uh, You know, you've written that the grand old party faces a big problem based on the word old. Republicans are older and dying faster than Democrats, according to your calculations. Do Republican strategists understand the problem that you describe? Oh, yes, they do. (laughs) (laughs) I was talking to one who told me, and I kind of agreed with him like this. He said, it's kind of like a snake eating rats. Okay? Now, the snake wants to have live rats coming in one side, and rats that are 
kind of decompose coming out that other end. Okay, right now they have too many decomposed rats coming out the one end and not enough live rats sort of coming in on the front end. And if you're running a business, if you're in politics, et cetera, you have to have that balance. And they, and they don't have it. And a lot of them say that this is their sort of last big chance uh, to have this kind of age range in their party in the uh, Sort of 2016 because after 2016, um, it changes quite a bit in uh, in their older voters starting to die more quickly. Let's say. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's true that as people get older, marry, have kids, buy houses, flourish in careers, that that they naturally become more conservative? Because if that's so, aren't the new middle-aged men and women replacing old people on Republican registration rolls? Yes and no. I mean, like all of us have heard that old saying that if you're a conservative while you're young, you have no soul. And if you're a kind of liberal as you're old, you have no brain. Okay, uh, And that does work out. However, 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 big, big thing here is that um, because they are playing towards their older base on a lot of the social issues, and I'm talking about same-sex marriage, abortion, sort of global warming, et cetera, et cetera, um, they're losing a lot of people just straight off the bat. And that's not only young people. A lot of the people, I'm in my mid-50s, and a lot of people in my age group are saying, well, you know what, if they're saying that the dinosaurs, like, sort of didn't live, that the world started like 12,000 years ago. If they get into that, a lot of people are just out. Okay. I mean, they're out from the beginning and they're not going to listen to anything else. So I think they've made a major error in playing to the extreme of their party who goes, who gets excited about those issues. And they should do like all parties have done in the past, which is tell their extremes to get in their cages and be quiet until the election is over. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but they don't do that and it's and it's and I don't understand why hmm you know a couple of wild cards here uh the possibility of Hillary Clinton being the democratic nominee and the growing hispanic population so okay. for one can, can Hillary take otherwise republican votes from moderate to conservative women and two do democrats have a lock on the hispanic vote well, first of all, I'll deal with the Hispanic vote, which um, I don't think it's going to be important, and here's why. Of the states that have a large Hispanic population, so if we're talking about so California, um, Texas, Illinois, New York, those states aren't in play, okay? The states... Of the swing states, of the states that are in play, there's only two that I'm looking at that that have a decent Hispanic population, and one would be Florida, uh, and that is a population that's not a sort of monolithic Hispanic sort of population. It has South America islands, some Mexicans, so, so. the only state that it's going to come into play is in or to Colorado, which is which is one that, that most people don't think of, but they have a pretty rising Hispanic population. So I'm not saying that Hispanic votes don't count. I just don't see them being a big issue in this election. Um, and um, I'm sorry. And, uh, and, and the on other, your first, the, the other side is is can Hillary take the the Republican votes from moderate to conservative women? Yes. Uh, yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, and it and it should and it'll play big in Florida. Uh, um, because there's a, uh, uh, Florida has a lot of moderate, older women, you know, East coast of who have kind of moved down there. And, uh, yeah, I think she, I think she can. And I think, uh, that, that could be a very key issue if she can just kind of take enough of them who might've voted for sort of John McCain or Romney and are saying to themselves, well, here we've got a candidate who is like us. Uh, yeah, I think that I, I, I think she can, but again, she has to, 
she's going to have to tread a fine line there. We're speaking with Daniel McGraw, Cleveland area freelance journalist and author. Uh, Republican presidential candidates, Daniel, are, are now all talking about income disparities pretty much for the first time. Do you yeah. think that will help them peel votes away from the Democratic base of people who are usually on the wrong side of that disparity? Um, I think they can. However, it depends how they're uh, – if they just start talking about how – how they're for the poor folks that are trying hard, blah, blah, blah. It'll be easy to say, uh, okay, but have you guys done anything in the last 15 years or so? You know, it it, it is going to be a message that if they're going to win, that they are going to have to pound that message out, okay? But as I said before, if they kind of mix that with all of the craziness of all of these kind of, folks on the far right with the uh oh with the global warming and the and the same-sex marriage stuff i don't i i i mean i just don't i i think that that message is going to get sort of drowned out Mm -hmm. uh marco rubio does he have the best chance at getting the millennial vote just on his youth appeal and his eloquence i don't think so yeah um He's, no, I mean, part of the thing that he he has shown is that he has waffled quite a bit already, okay? Now, I mean, he just jumps from one side to the other. He doesn't seem to know where he stands on immigration. He doesn't seem to know where he stands on this and that. Now, wait until he's in the primaries, okay, where folks are going to be dragging him all over the spectrum. And see, he's going to, as I said before, he's going to have to learn how to deal with these sort of social issues and he hasn't shown any ability to like stand up and say uh this stuff with the same sex marriage it's already done let's move on okay it, you know if i heard him saying that i'd say that he would have a chance but if he if he keeps trying to appeal too much to that core base I don't think he's I, I I mean I don't think any of them will have much of a chance if much of a chance with people under 40 years old if they keep on that bent in, in that they they'd be going too far to the right. Yes. I mean yeah. and it's and it's always been that way that you go in the primaries you go towards the extreme and then you come back into the middle but in the past elections in the primaries they have gone so far into the extreme that it's tough it's tough for them to get back. And second of all, uh, kind of then they are on record and it's easy to attack them afterwards. So, I mean, I, I just, I just, I just think they box themselves into a corner and they're trying to appeal towards this older base too, too much. Yeah. You gotta be careful about the hole you dig yourself in. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's very hard to get out of. Absolutely. Have you done any research on the effect of state by state voting laws on turnout and and on election results? Well, here's do you think do you think there's a concerted effort in red states to depress the democratic? Oh, sure, sure. I'm seeing most of the uh, one of the things that's happening in a lot of states is that they're is that they're trying to uh, take take the place that college students live, like you know, and I'm speaking of. Uh, their college address, trying to take that out of the voting thing so that they have to vote at their sort of parents' home address, let's say, they, and trying to play that game. Um, that's one. And, again, if you move it a point or two, that's tough. I don't think that a lot of the ID sort of changes in the voter thing is going to have that much effect because um, I've kind of worked on – he had a lot of campaigns in my life, and as soon as you set certain rules, all campaigns are going to figure out how to kind of make those work for them. So I don't see that as a big thing. I do think that address thing of folks in college might, 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 might have a small impact. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't know if this is a, a, a real problem, but with all the early voting and, and, and both parties' reliance on absentee ballots, it, couldn't a lot of people vote who will die before Election Day? What's that again? I'm sorry? Couldn't a lot of people voting early 
absentee ballots and and, and the like. Yeah. Couldn't couldn't they be dead by the time it gets to election day? <laughs> I mean, how, well, how big an issue might yes, that be? And then again, then again, I don't know. I could kind of, I could kind of die on my way, sort of going to the polls, right? No, I don't think that's a that's a kind of big factor at all. I mean, it's it's. I mean, how we set up these kind of rules of voting. There's, you know, access is key. Um, if you have a voter base that shows up early and often, then, then you don't want any of these changes. But no, I don't think that's going to be a kind of big thing. I just think that the biggest issue is that the Republican Party is aging very, very quickly. And as I said at the open here, they aren't getting the young people sort of coming in. And, um, and that does not sort of bode well at all and all of them know it but they just don't want to but they don't want to alienate that older sort of voter base and i would tell them uh that those older voters don't have any place else to kind of go so they're gonna vote for your candidate anyway so i right. just you know i but but they have to get their votes and their cash and all that stuff so i don't know Okay. Daniel McGraw, freelance journalist and author, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Daniel, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon. Okay. Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You are quite welcome. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan. Congressman, with all the um, all this news flying around and every, everything happening so much, Hillary Clinton comes to the Hill yesterday and meets with the entire Democratic caucus. Yeah, it was uh, great. How'd it go? It was it was really good. I mean, a lot of the focus was on her core message, uh, and then she had time for for questions. I I did uh, raise a question regarding the Iran agreement. Uh, she did so, uh, spend some time, you know, providing her thoughts on that, which I think was really helpful and timely given her role history as the Secretary yeah, of State right. and actually initiating much of the engagement with Iran herself. Uh, yeah, I thought it was good. It was a really good exchange, and uh, she obviously has a lot of friends in the room, and I count myself among them. Mm -hmm. Have you endorsed yet? I have. You have? Yeah, very early on. Uh, I, I've known uh, uh, Hillary for a long time. I uh, met her back when, um, when Bill was in the White House and have had a good relationship with her, and I'm happy to, to support her. Uh, and she picked up, it's, it's, from what I've read, it was a, a very positive session, picked up a lot of friends, if not even more supporters. I think yeah. so. I mean, uh, I, she was really uh, focused, and I think uh, her core message was really the, the thing that I think impressed a lot of people. But her knowledge of the subject, like the subject of the day, Iran, as compared to the cacophony oh. of competing press releases from folks on the <laughs> other side, I mean, it's the difference couldn't be more stark in terms of her preparation for that kind of a, of a question. Yeah, and the first big difference is she knows what she's talking about, right. and none of them do. Right, yeah. no question right. about it. Uh, you, uh, we, None of us have seen the deal yet or have a chance to read it. From what you know about it, um, is it a deal that, what do you think about it? Is it good for this country? Well, I'm generally favorable. I'm going to actually take the time to review the agreement. Whoa, I know. Unusual. I know. Yeah, right. I'm, going to, I'm going to read it. And, and consider both the text and the context. And I think that's really an important distinction. The text meaning, what does it really say? Because I've heard all sorts of members of Congress, some that I was with last night, reciting elements of the agreement that are simply not factual as a justification for their opposition to it. The context, though, is also critical. Because we can criticize this agreement. But in order to decide that it's not the right path forward, we actually have to examine what the other alternatives really are. Mm -hmm. yeah, is is right. it possible, for example, to go back and get a new agreement? I think that's really going to be tough. After all, the P5 plus one 
they have their deal. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Germany, they Britain, all signed off on Russia, this, right? China, France, U.S. have signed off on this deal. This is the deal. So that leaves what other options? Uh, a military intervention? I mean, I don't think the American people are, are at that mm. place. Mm. We really have to ask ourselves, as compared to the logical other paths forward, is this the path that's safer for the world? Do we have the opportunity to deal with Iran and all of its bad behavior absent their possession of a nuclear weapon? Or will we deal with uh, Iran in all of its bad behavior with the threat that they may gain a nuclear weapon? And that's we have to judge whether this agreement actually takes us there. Obviously, for me, I'm also very interested in whether Iran will unilaterally act to release the Americans that they hold, including... Well, I wanted to ask you about that next, because you last time you were in, we've talked about this, one of the um, Americans held in Iran is a constituent of yours. Right. Amir, uh, Amir Hekmati, a 31-year-old guy from Flint, Michigan. His parents were born in Iran, but he was born and raised in the U.S. He went mm-hmm. to visit... And it's next month, it will be four years that he has sat in Evan prison. And you've been working with his family for yes. all that time uh, to, to, uh, you know, get, to get his release. Um, should, or, do you think that, and this was uh, something we talked at the White House about with, uh, with Josh Ernest, right. do you think the fate of these prisoners should have been part of this deal? No, I don't. I think it would have been dangerous for the United States to enter into an agreement in exchange for the freedom of Americans who are innocent, something else at the negotiating table. This this was a very delicately reached agreement. Again, we have to evaluate it. Right. But if we included them in the deal, the nature of of negotiation is that something would have been given in order to secure that concession from them. And that something would be something that makes the world a a less safe place. My constituent, Amir Hikmati, uh, is a patriot. He served in the Marine Corps, and he said hmm. he does not want to be traded for any concession at that nuclear bargaining table. And that's been the position of the other Americans so to, as well. To the extent that you can tell us, um, do you believe that the administration is doing what it can to secure his release? I do. Uh, I've spoken to the president on many times about this and spoken to Secretary Kerry. Uh, there have been sidebar discussions at virtually every negotiation session of the P5 plus one hmm. regarding the status of these Americans, not as a part of the negotiation, right, but, but sort of off to the side. And, and I'm confident that they continue to press. Um, What's Iran saying that they're, the, what, what are they charging them with? Well, in the case of Amir, and this is also the case of, of Jason Rezaian, the Washington the Post Washington. reporter, mm-hmm. they've been charged with uh, cooperating with a hostile government. In the case of Amir Hekmati, he was a member of the United States Marine Corps, and under Iranian law, these people are considered Iranian citizens, even though they were born and raised in the United States. Under their law, a first-generation expat is still an Iranian. And so when you put those two facts together, that's where they they uh, see these people as Iranian citizens cooperating with, with, the, United uh, States. with the United States. And now, they're citizens of the United citizens States. Citizens born and raised in the case of Amir Hekmati. Yeah. The, the issue for me in this case, too, gets even more interesting because now you have Iran sitting across a diplomatic table with this so-called hostile government entering into a pretty substantial agreement. So even the underlying fact of the hostility of this nation and that Mm -hmm. has Mm -hmm. has come into question at this point in time as well. So we we just think Iran needs to do the right thing and make a gesture that I think would further validate some of the other uh, efforts that they're trying to make to be seen as a legitimate player on the world stage. If they release these Americans, it would make a difference in terms of the way some, myself included, would view that nation. Now, the, the entire shift now um, f- from uh, uh, with the Iran deal shifts to Congress because 60 days, the clock is ticking. Uh, and we already heard yesterday Leader Mitch McConnell and Speaker John Boehner come out and pan the deal, condemn right. the deal. And, you know, they're going to do uh, what they can to try to get a majority of Congress against it. H- how do you think that's going to fly? Well, I think it'll in the Senate it'll probably be close. I'm not real sure in the House. Uh, I haven't heard any Republicans in the House indicate a positive reaction to the deal. But there was an understanding 
that Congress entered into with the president in saying, look, we're going to sort of grant this negotiating authority and we will uh, put Congress in a position to override the agreement. So Congress went into this with eyes open, knowing that it would take a two-thirds majority of both bodies of Congress in order to stop the deal. And that was an explicit Right. Eyes open understanding. Two-thirds in the House and two-thirds in the Senate. Correct. To override it. Correct. And then the president could still veto well, it, Well, if, if, if it was an override-proof uh, or a veto-proof oh, right. uh, vote, yeah. then no. So the yeah. real question, the threshold here is two-thirds in each body. Um, the House is tough to say. Uh, a lot of eyes will be on, on the, both bodies. I, I, I'm particularly interested in the Senate because it's more likely that the Senate will act before it comes to the House. It's possible mm-hmm. that the Senate will act before they recess. That soon? Possible. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just two weeks from Well, me. they have an extra week here. Oh, I got it. Um, it takes them longer to get their, to not get their work done, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Right. <laughs> Congressman Dan Kildee uh, here with us on a very historic day, very busy day here in Washington. Let's say hello to Walter out in Hearst, Texas. Hey, Walter, good morning. Good morning. I hope you're doing well today. We are. Thank you. Yeah. What's your question or comment? My question to the to the congressman and the press and not yourself is, what is the alternative to this deal? I mean, I've had service myself. I've had my son in service. I was a Vietnam guy. My, my son's mm-hmm. uh, a desert storm. And our consensus is we don't want to go fight again. So what is the Republican alternative. It appears that every time they ask one, they change the subject. <laughs> so what? what is their alternative? All right. Good, good. Uh, the most important question, I think, Walter, indeed. Take your answer on the air, Congressman. It is the most important question because it's the alternatives that we have to measure this agreement against. So it seems that the alternatives are fairly limited. One that has been suggested that I don't think is realistic is to go back and renegotiate and a deal. Not it's not going to happen because yeah. this is the deal that was negotiated over a very long period of time. It is the result of multilateral diplomatic yeah. efforts. Yeah. And Russia and China and Britain and France and Germany have signed off on this. So I, I think that's an interesting theoretical option, but it's not real. Uh, the other option, unfortunately, would be that we would see the progression of Iran's aspiration toward a nuclear weapon continue And then we have to ask ourselves whether we are willing to either engage in a military action or support a military action that might be launched, say, by Israel. That's a dangerous option, one that has consequences that we can't even fathom at this point in time. I heard a member of Congress, a Republican member of Congress last night, suggest that there was another option, and that was regime change. Well, come on. (laughs) I mean, how has that worked? How does that? How, how do you operationalize that? How does it work out? So, all these other options—they I mean, sound interesting. Yeah, that's like pie in the sky. Sure, it would be great if suddenly there were a new democratic leader of Iran, right? And yeah. I would love to have all my hair back. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. th- these are just not options that are realistic that we can plan for. Uh, here's the thing: diplomacy's hard. It's hard to do. And it's hard to accept. And by definition, it's almost always criticized at the moment. Nixon to China, engagement with Russia, look at what the president has done with Cuba. Anytime you have a diplomatic effort, it's so easy to criticize it because you don't have to be responsible for the alternative. And that's unfortunate. No, absolutely. Excellent point to end with, uh, Congressman. Uh, Sorry we're out of time, but thank you so much for coming in again. All right. Keep up the good fight. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Stephen Miles, Daniel McGraw, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate. Donate.